Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Ellen, and I'm a bookseller here at Bookmarks. Um, just going to do a brief introduction, and then we will get started. Um, so um, if you're not familiar with Bookmarks, we are an independent bookstore and nonprofit in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, and again, we're glad that you're here. I'm just going to go over, um, if you haven't used Crowdcast before, I'm just going to go over um, some inst brief instructions. Um, so we are going to do a, a Q&A at the end of the, the presentation, and you are welcome to, um, any questions that you have, or you are welcome to put them in the chat box, and um, I'll, I'll address those with our author at the end of her presentation. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, um, try refreshing your browser or using a new one. Um, this this is recorded, so you will be able to watch this later um, with the original link that you were sent. Um, and um, so, yeah, if you have any questions about that um, during the presentation, you can just put that in the chat box and um, and I will hopefully be able to help you with that. But um, we'll just go ahead um, and get started. Just um, a brief um um, just some brief housekeeping notes. Um, um, just be aware that bookmarks doesn't tolerate rude behavior or um, comments of any kind like that. So if you, so you'll be removed um, from the from the um, event um, in the event of something like that. But I'm sure that we won't have any problems with that. So I'm just going to introduce our author. Um, Tanya is Israel is presenting her book. Beyond Your Bubble, um, How to Connect Across the Political Divide. Um, she is a professor of counseling, clinical, and school psychology at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Um, she has a master's degree in human sexuality education and a BA from psych in psychology and women's studies for, from the University of Pennsylvania. And we are just really excited for her to um, come and join us and um, discuss this book, which is amazing um, and very timely. Um, so we are just pleased to have her here to discuss this. And we're just going to go ahead and get started. And um, again, if you have any questions, you can just put them in the chat box and we'll address them at the Q&A. All right. Okay. All right, here we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to Ellen and to Bookmarks for hosting this stop on my virtual book tour. And um, so much appreciation to all of you for taking the time to attend. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about the origin story of the book and read some excerpts. And I'll show you a few things from the book as well. So. The United States is acutely divided. We are me too and make America great again. We are gun rights and we are gun control. We are oil and coal and climate change. We are tearing down Confederate monuments and we are building walls to keep immigrants out. We are marching and shouting and we are weeping and cheering. We are tweeting and sharing and liking and unfriending. We are in turmoil. This is how I start Beyond Your Bubble, how to connect across the political divide, skills and strategies for conversations that work. Talk a little bit about how the book came about. Um, if we go way back in the 90s, I started a group to bring together pro-choice and pro-life people to have dialogue with each other. And that experience was transformational for me, not because it changed anything about how I felt about the topic, but because it changed everything about how I felt about people who disagreed with me about it. And I have carried that experience with me for the past several decades, and it's affected how I view things and my openness, I think, to hearing different views and really wanting to bring people together who have different views. So 
fast forward to the 2016 election. It was pretty clear that our country was divided. And as a psychologist, I was seeing ways that the polarization was really affecting us. It was affecting people's families. It was affecting us in the workplace. Our communities were divided. And it's even been affecting our health, that our stress is increased because of political discord. So I have experience teaching helping skills and facilitating difficult dialogues about a lot of different topics, um, particularly around religion, sexual orientation, abortion, law enforcement. All of these are things that I've done over the years. And I was hearing people say, we need to be reaching across this divide. We need to be having these conversations. But I wasn't really seeing anybody saying how to do that. And I, and I didn't think it was completely obvious to people how to go about doing that. And so I thought, well, maybe I have something that I can offer. So I started by creating something that I thought, um, well, th this, this is a resource that might be helpful. So I'm going to show you right now what I um, created. Mm -hmm if I can figure out how to do it on here. Well, I created something that I call the flow chart that will resolve all political conflict in our country. And it doesn't seem to be, um, no, nope, I can't show it. Sorry. Oh, I think I'll be able to share other things on my screen, but I don't think I can share this. I will. I will pop the um, the website into the chat section so that you can see. You can go take a look at it if you would like. Um, so, so what I wanted to do was to help people to be more intentional about how they're having these conversations. And um, so, this flowchart was really a way to think about: okay, you know, are you ready to have these conversations? What do you want to get out of these conversations? So, spoiler alert: uh, this flowchart did not actually resolve all political conflict in our country. So, I decided to create something more. So I developed this two hour workshop that was really to help people to develop skills so that they could have dialogue. And um, several hundred people went through the workshop and um, as they came to the workshop, I would ask them, what is it that draws you to this? Like, why are you coming? What interests you about dialogue? And so I heard some things over and over again. Uh, some people would say, there's someone in my life with whom I want to maintain a good relationship. Or some people said, I want to persuade or convince others to see things the way I do. Some people are just having trouble understanding why people think or act or vote as they do. Some people were looking to uh, find common ground with people on the other side. Some people want to heal that political divide. And some people were just feeling distressed and didn't know what to do. And so they came to the workshop. So maybe you can reflect on if there are things that would that would bring you to this and, and maybe what brought you uh, to this uh, to this event today. But after the workshop, people gained some knowledge, they gained some skills, but they still wanted more. And so that's why I ended up writing a book. I thought, well, this is something that, that I can elaborate on these things and make it widely available to folks. So the book draws on psychological research and skills to inform dialogue. So it's evidence-based. It, it's, it's, there's large bodies of evidence in psychology that support what I'm saying in this book, but I also didn't want to write it like a researcher. I am a researcher, but I thought I want to write it in a way that is really accessible and, and that people can really immediately put into use uh, the, the material in here. So it's short enough not to be daunting. So, so this is the book. Ellen showed it to you also. See, it's not that long. And, um, and it, um, and it includes a lot of really, very uh, applicable information. So I'm going to share a passage. I'm going to read something that um, so that you can get a sense of the book, because this passage really does help to frame the book. Keeping in mind common motivations for engaging in dialogue, what do you think might help maintain relationships, understand different views, find common ground, persuade, and reduce distress? 
You might want to explain why you're right. You might want to cite research. You might want to point out logical inconsistencies. You might want to walk away. You might want to tell them that they're idiots. You can react in any number of ways. However, these actions are not going to help you reach your goals. They're not going to achieve the ends you've identified as your motivations for engaging in dialogue. For successful dialogue across political lines, it turns out there are only two things you need to do. First, try to understand people on the other side. And second, help them feel safe and understood. That's it. Why do you need to try to understand them? I often hear from people who are mystified by people on the other side. If desire to understand is in itself a motive for you to engage in dialogue, it can be met by developing greater insight into others with differing views. Understanding people who are different from you will also help you to accomplish other goals. If you want to find common ground, you will need to understand them as well as yourself and look for commonalities. If you want to persuade, you'll need to understand their beliefs and values to be effective in shifting their views. And if you simply want to reduce your distress, I find that some of the distress people are experiencing arises from being mystified about others' views and in the uncertainty about how others will act. Insight into others can alleviate some of this distress. Why do you need to help them feel safe and understood? Quite simply, the safer and more understood people feel, the more they will be open to engage in dialogue. When people feel confronted or attacked, they shut down and become even more committed to polarized views. When they feel safe and understood, they are less defensive, less agitated, more able to express their views, and more likely to listen to yours. They will be more willing partners in seeking common ground and less resistant to opening their minds to alternative ways of thinking. That's from chapter one. And the rest of the book lays out the skills that are needed to promote understanding and safety. So the book includes um, the skills of listening. So that's about how to listen non-verbally and how to reflect what people are telling you and ask open questions. I also um, include a chapter about managing emotions because you might notice that when you are either engaging in dialogue across political lines or even just thinking about it, your blood pressure starts to go up. And so this chapter tells you how to get past that fight, flight, or freeze reaction that we typically have when we feel threatened. And it's also about how to de-escalate conflict. And in the case where you want to get out of, of dialogue, if it's feeling unsafe, how do you do that? There's also a chapter on cultivating understanding because it turns out that our perceptions of people on the other side and even our perceptions of ourselves tend to be distorted. So this chapter helps to correct for those distortions. People always want to know, when do I get to talk? When do I get to actually express my views? And so there's a chapter on how to share your views most effectively. So I have a chapter on listening skills, and then I'll have a chapter on talking skills. And then there's a thing about skills in context, because we're not having these conversations in a vacuum. There are existing relationships you have with other people. Sometimes there are power differentials if you're talking with your boss or with your supervisee. Um, and then how do we actually move these skills into action? Um, how do we strengthen those skills ourselves? How do we make an action plan if we're not sure how to move forward? Um, how do we invite other people into our dialogue? And then how do we actually exit the dialogue in such a way that we can either pick it up again later or bring it to a graceful close? So not only does the book have information about these topics, but it also has activities and examples of dialogue. So I created a fictional set of cousins who have very different views. And they discuss a range of topics. They talk about immigration, Black Lives Matter, gender, abortion. 
So I created a video uh, with a friend of mine to bring one of these conversations to life. And so I'm going to try to share this with you now. And what you'll see is, first of all, these two characters. I'll, I'll be playing one of them. So um, uh, and then my friend Pema. And you'll see um, these characters have uh, introduced themselves. And then they're going to have a conversation that doesn't go very well. And this might resonate for you. You might be like, yes, that's what conversations feel like, or that's what I expect conversations to be like. And then after that, they're going to um, have that same conversation, but they're going to apply some of the skills in the book. And uh, we'll see what that conversation looks like. So I'm going to share um, a video and just about five minutes long, and then... Um, if you have questions about it, we'll be able to talk about that a little later, too. I have an associate's degree, and I'm an office manager in a small business. My friends and I care a lot about our local community. I support my church, and I'm active in my kids' school. I consider myself pro-life, but I'm not an activist. I feel like liberals are always criticizing people like me, putting me down, calling me uneducated. So I mostly limit conversations with people who disagree about politics. I work for a nonprofit. I donate money to political organizations, and I am mystified by people who watch Fox News. I feel a sense of urgency about climate change, and I'm incensed by rollbacks on environmental regulation. I haven't been to church since I left home for college 20 years ago. I embrace opportunities to advocate for social justice. I just renewed my health insurance and I can't believe how much it costs. Wasn't Obamacare supposed to be affordable? It was obviously a huge failure. But it does make it affordable for millions of Americans who couldn't get health insurance otherwise. I thought you didn't even have health insurance before. Isn't it better to know that you're covered in case something happens? No, I'd rather keep my money and use it to stay healthy and pay my own medical bills. Why should I have to pay for insurance if I don't need it? I take care of myself, I don't smoke, I work out, I eat healthy. It doesn't seem fair that I do all that and I'm paying a ton so I can support a guy who drank himself into a liver transplant. It's not like everyone who needs health care is at fault. Are you saying my mom was to blame for her heart attack? That's harsh. And there's no way she could have paid the hospital bill herself. It was huge. And the insurance company wouldn't cover the whole thing. We're still disputing it. My mom is so worried about the money, it can't be good for her health. See, health insurance doesn't work. We need to let people make their own choices. That's not what I'm saying. We need to regulate how much hospitals can charge. We need a single-payer system. Oh, great. Socialized medicine. More government interference. Just what we need. So what's wrong with socialized medicine? Our taxes would double and the quality of health care would plummet. That's ridiculous. Where are you getting your facts? I just renewed my health insurance and I can't believe how much it costs. Wasn't Obamacare supposed to be affordable? It was obviously a huge failure. Mm -hmm. I mean, forcing everyone to get insurance and then we have these crappy choices that cost a fortune, this is exactly why we shouldn't have government interfering where it doesn't belong. You're pretty upset about how much you're paying for health insurance. You bet I am. I mean, why should I have to pay for insurance if I don't need it? I take care of myself, I don't smoke, I work out, I eat healthy. It doesn't seem fair that I do all that, and I'm paying a ton so I can support a guy who drank himself into a liver transplant. You do a lot to stay healthy, and you resent that other people don't. Exactly. I agree that Obamacare isn't great. I think private insurance companies are a lousy way to provide health care coverage. They spend all this money on marketing and paying shareholders, which jacks up the cost of medical care, and then they don't even pay when you need them. Mm -hmm. When my mom had a heart attack last year, the hospital bill was outrageous. The insurance company wouldn't cover the whole thing, and we were left with this huge bill. We're still disputing it. And my mom is so worried about the money, it can't be good for her health. Sounds like it's been pretty stressful. Definitely, it's been such a mess. 
I get that you feel like the current insurance system isn't working. How do you think healthcare should be covered? I really like the idea of the government overseeing the healthcare system, a single payer plan. That way they could regulate the medical costs and cut out the insurance company profits that should have no place in healthcare. So you think we should all be covered under a government run health insurance plan? Exactly. Okay, so that might give you a little sense of what the book is about. Um, the, um, the, the two people in that scenario were using some of the skills that are in the book. And what you'll see throughout the book is that the skills are being applied to a lot of different topics and you'll get to see the different skills in there as well. Uh, so if you, uh, if, if that sounds interesting to you, then, um, then you can get more information about the book. I'll also put, um, uh, so you can obviously, uh, get it from bookmarks, but if you also want to know more about the workshop, um, or I've, I've got an opportunity if you want to fill out a survey so you can tell me more about what your experience has been like having dialogue, you can do that as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to read another excerpt um, to, to close out this portion. Um, and then after that, you'll be able to ask questions. So if you've got questions, you can go ahead and, and start adding them to the chat. Um, but I just want to, um, to share this piece. Finally, I want to acknowledge the United States of America. Our differences are woven into the fabric of our country. Our ability to connect across these differences strengthens us collectively. I feel so fortunate to be part of this amazing mix of people. My aspiration is that this book cultivates our compassion and skills and helps us reach our greatest potential. Okay. Thank you for your attention for all of that. And, and uh, I would love to hear any questions that you have or any, uh, if you want to share anything about your own experience with dialogue, please share that too. Oh, Ellen, I can't hear you. You might be muted. Okay, I can well. Uh, thank well, you. Oh, there thank you. you. Great. Welcome Sorry back. about that. I just said um, so. Thank you for for that. And if you have any questions, um, just put them in the chat box. So nice. Kristen says, "How well do these skills work when only one person is using them, and the other is just using talking points?" That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things I say about dialogue is this is a, a book. That is, and, and these skills are best for people who want to be engaged in dialogue, like when two people want to actually be engaged in dialogue. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is actually applying the skills, though. Um, so, so sometimes it can feel like, well, what if I'm just using the skills and the other person isn't? They're just doing their regular thing. It turns out that if you're using the skills, it's going to help the other person to be able to engage in dialogue also and do more of that. So. Like, like as you saw in the video, if one person is reflecting back, then it allows the other person to elaborate and not get so heated about the way that they're approaching things. And you can also ask, ask questions so that you're asking people more about like, tell me more about your experience that, that brought you to your views. Um, tell me a little bit more about how you think that's going to work and questions that lend themselves to somebody being able to you know, get out of that just sharing of stats and slogans that sometimes we can fall into otherwise. Thanks for that question. That was a great question. Um, I would like just to make a comment. I really enjoyed um, and found very useful. Um, it's in the chapter getting started and you talk about the differences between 
dialogue, discourse, and debate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you maybe talk a little bit about the differences between those? Absolutely. So we, we, I also talk about diatribe, which is, uh, I think what we're most used to seeing on TV sort of, and this is one of the challenges is that people imagine when they're going to talk to somebody who's got a different political view, that it's going to be one of these heated discussions that they see on TV. Cause you know, TV needs to um, provide something that's that th where there's conflict. And so what we see are people who are spokespeople for the most extreme views of um, different sides of a topic typically. So that's more diatribe where people are just venting. They're not really listening to each other and, and they're, and they're um, more extreme in their views. We also have things like debate. I mean, if, if you, um, well, our, our debates that we're seeing on TV are not necessarily examples of like classic debate, but classic debate like high school debate club is, you know, people trying to make their points and, and you want to win, you know, so you're trying to actually um, show that you've got the best argument so that some, you know, some judges can determine that you're the winner. So in dialogue, you're not actually trying to win. In that sense, you're not trying to beat the other person and make a better um, argument than they make. And even in things like discourse, like civil discourse, sometimes it's much more about sort of making, you know, the the argument, but not do, but also doing so in a in a calm fashion. So that's a civil discourse idea. The thing about dialogue is a lot of it's really about the relationship between the people, about maintaining that relationship, and what you really want to do if you want to maintain that relationship. And, and like I said, like no matter what your motivation is, you're going to want to understand the other person. So it's really about understanding and connection. And that's really what where dialogue can get us. And so if that's not your motivation, if what you really want to do is is just vent, then you know, this, this isn't really, then, then you're not really trying to have dialogue. You're also probably not going to get your goals met by talking with somebody who is on another side of the issue. Like if you really want to vent and, and get validated for that, you probably just want to talk to somebody who already agrees with you. So thanks for that. Yes. And yeah. 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 And, and, um, just to reiterate what you just said, I remember I says um, sometimes when we imagine ourselves in discussion with the person who disagrees with us politically, we have in our minds that we are going to be debating the spokesperson for what we disagree with. So I, I can I can totally relate to the, having that kind of mindset of just you know getting okay we're going to have this discussion it's going to be heated and argumentative and terrible so. Um, so I, I, I definitely marked that little passage. Um, and I, Matt I, says, go ahead. Oh, yes. I will just say that when I talk to people on the left, they often say, well, I can't even imagine how I would have this conversation with Donald Trump. And I say, well, it's very unlikely you're actually going to be having this conversation <laughs> with Donald Trump. So maybe yeah. we can sort of think about somebody who's a more likely conversation partner. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so Matt asks, do you have any thoughts about how to move people from a position of diatribe or debate to one of more fruitful dialogue? How possible is it to do it if there's not a clear relationship to begin with? I think that's a great question because sometimes we're having uh, these, there are opportunities for conversation with, with people who we don't already have that relationship with. And I found that if I'm just using these skills, then, then we get more into that pattern of, uh, of dialogue. So for example, I was, you know, I was out somewhere and I ran into somebody and they were sort of talking about, um, what was going on with the, um, uh, with regulations on real estate, you know, in a certain area. Something I didn't actually know that much about. And so I started asking questions, you know, it's somebody I didn't know. And I and I said, oh, well, tell me more about that. Like, I'm, I'm curious to know more. And and so they started sharing more and it was and it was a nice conversation. Sometimes they're not going to ask about your views, you know, and you can you can decide sort of how much you want to share your views. But it turned out in that context. It didn't really matter to me that I was able to share my views. I was really curious about where they came from. That met my goal for dialogue, which was to understand more. 
And so I think sometimes we think, well, then, then we're not getting what we want out of it because like I didn't get a chance to tell them what I thought. I would say that probably the greatest uh, error that I see people making when they're trying to have dialogue is thinking that there's a thing that you can say that's going to make all the difference in the world to this other person. And it's going to change how they view things and it's going to shift everything for them. And frankly, that's just unlikely that that's going to happen. So I would say that just by pra practicing listening, by remaining calm, by trying to take somebody else's perspective, um, you will actually be having the kind of dialogue that, that I'm talking about here. And so, so it will shift the other person if you're using these skills. That's a great point. That is a great point. Um, so would you, so would you say with, with honest dialogue, it, it's like with the, the cousins in the book about trying to, um, um, not necessarily maintain, but try to um, preserve, I guess, the, the, the relationship that you have with somebody that is completely different from you politically, just to be able to, you know, um, like with the cousins, their, uh, their children got them set up with this because they were missing each other. And, um, you know, the families were wanting to get together and things like that. So they set, they, you know, they set that up. So would you say that, um, dialogue in that context would be um, just trying to preserve relationships that you have in your life with people that are just completely different than you? I think there's a lot of it. I mean, relationships are really important in our lives. Um, friendships, families, uh, having, you know, uh, co-workers who we can get along with, like all of that is is such an essential part of our lives. And that's where, you know, sometimes we might recognize that there's a difference there and it's interfering with our ability to stay connected with somebody. And so mm -hmm. I, I actually provide some sort of sample scripts for ways to invite somebody into dialogue because sometimes we don't know exactly how to do that. But, but I think that that can be helpful to, um, to really intentionally say to somebody, I, I'm, I know that we come from different perspectives on this and I feel like it's getting in the way of our connection and I, and I really value our connection and I would like to be able to talk about these things and I'd like to know more about where you're coming from and I'm going to do the best I can to sort of remain calm and open to, to hearing from you. So, you know, there, there are ways we can sort of um, approach it so that the other person is most likely to come into it um, wanting something similar to that. Okay. Um, Claudia asks, what ways can I support myself if feelings come up during or following a dialogue? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question because, you know, everybody is, I think, having a lot of tension around this and, and a lot of feelings that come up. You know, our, our, um, our bodies are sort of built to respond to stress in a certain way. Um, and they're, and, and, Really what we are responding to is kind of this threat that, uh, that we might have encountered, you know, um, back in the stone ages, you know, that there's a, there, there's a saber tooth tiger and we're reacting to that and our blood pressure goes up and our face feels flushed and our heart's racing and, and, uh, and our breath gets really shallow and, that's what's happening, not even just when people are in conversation, but even just imagining it. Because just imagining having a heated conversation with somebody, our body is perceiving as, as the same level of threat as a saber-toothed tiger. And so what we can do is work with what we know about um, our, our bodies to try to sort of de-escalate our own reaction to it. So one of the most effective tools that we have is something that we are doing all the time anyway, which is breathing. Um, but sometimes we want to shift our breathing so that it's, you know, not our regular breathing, but slower and deeper breathing. I, I sometimes say, you know, I, the book is beyond your bubble. And so I like using bubble um, uh, imagery. And so if you think about the kind of breathing that you would do if you're blowing bubbles, if you've got the little plastic wand and you're, that kind of breathing 
can be so restorative for us and help to get us back in a place where we can actually have these uh, conversations. We can also do sort of a physical grounding of ourselves, just being aware of our bodies, our the feeling of our feet on the floor or the connection between our body and the chair, or even just like touching our own hand um, can help to, to ground us physically. So I would say, you know, being aware of the response that you're having in your body can be really helpful so that then you you can do some of these things that help to bring us back to a calmer state. So would you, um, would, so would you say it's, it would be, it would be wise to anticipate a situation um, where you're, dis you're, you're going to be disagreeing with somebody. Um, do you think it's so, do you think it's wise to anticipate, Anticipate that kind of situation and prepare for it beforehand with the person, like say um, with Kevin and Celine in the book, um, say, you know, I don't, I don't think that they mentioned any kind of family gathering or anything that's, that was getting ready to happen. I think their children were, were just wanting to, to help the two of them. But, you know, if you're anticipating some kind of fa family gathering, do you think that it's um, best to meet and, talk with the person beforehand before, you know, I mean, yeah. politics come up, sometimes they don't. So it's just kind of, right. what do you think about that? I, I think that's a great question too. It can, sometimes people can get caught off guard by things and you don't necessarily want to catch them off guard because that doesn't necessarily um, put them in the best place to really be able to have this dialogue. So I think um, that it can be good to reach out to somebody and say, I know we're going to be seeing each other soon, and I know that sometimes politics comes up and it gets a little heated, and I would love to connect with you beforehand so we could just, you know, have some conversation that will hopefully help it to be easier when we are, when we're together, you know. So I think it can be helpful to lay that groundwork. I'll say also, though, sometimes there are things that just that just happened that you're not anticipating or, um, or, or prepared for. And so it can be really useful to, um, just have these things in mind, to have read about them, to have practiced them even, um, so that when you encounter a situation, then it's easier for you to just like click into that. Okay. This is what's going on. I'm going to practice my active listening right now. And that's going to be good. I'm noticing that, you know, my, um, that, that my emotions are getting elevated in this situation. So I'm going to work on breathing. Like I'm recognizing this as dialogue across political lines, and I'm going to use these skills and respond in these ways. Absolutely. Um, do we have any other questions? You can go ahead and put those in the chat box now. Tanya, do you have any um, any closing comments or anything else that you would like to say? I, I think the only thing I'd want to add is because I, I feel like people are so discouraged right now about the possibility yes. of connecting and the possibility of dialogue. And having done this work, having done the workshops, I've been talking to a lot of people about this since the book came out. And I just want to share, I am incredibly optimistic. And I am optimistic because people are interested, not just in my book and my workshops. There's all of these different organizations that are doing this kind of work, that are actually bringing people together to have this sort of dialogue. And I'm, and, and people can also, you know, these skills are learnable. These are skills that, that anybody can really learn and practice and, and, and implement. So I feel like it's a, it's a very practical kind of problem that we're having. And there's some very practical solutions, but there's also, I don't know, maybe even something of a zeitgeist of people really wanting to solve this problem. And that I find really encouraging. So if nothing else, I just want to share my optimism because I feel like so much of the stress people are experiencing right now has to do with feeling discouraged and feeling pessimistic that there's anything that we can do about it. Um, but I think we've got great opportunity here and I have a lot of hope for that. I felt that way too, reading this book. Um, I felt very optimistic about it and very hopeful, um, not just, you know, with relationships in my own life, but um, just 
globally, you know, with your community or, you know, just these are, are just are very valuable tools and skills to have. And I, I just, I was very encouraged. Um, and um, I just, I just, I found this very, very, very helpful. Um, so I have put the link for this book in the chat box. Um, if there are no other questions, we are, we were, we really appreciate you being here um, and um, going over these tools and skills. And we are, we're just, we're just thrilled about this. So we really appreciate you being here. Um, thanks for everyone who um, joined us this evening. And um, um, if there are no other questions, then we will, um, then we will sign off for now. Okay. Thank you very much. This has been delightful. Thank you. Everyone have a good night.